It's preparing now. Let me just check the Facebook here. I think it's red now. Uh, on. Yeah. Not. So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here again one of my favorite guests, Peter Gross. So Peter I Gross remember. received his PhD in microbiology in 2006 from the University of Basel. Basel. Uh, with the, working with uh, Guy Cornelis, and after that, in 2008, he joined the lab of Denis Monat when he started to work with inflammasomal complexes. So he turned to the basil as a assistant professor in 2013, investigating links between cell autonomous immune and inflammasome activation. He joined the Department of Biochemistry as an associated professor in 2017. And now his uh, current research focuses on uh, host defense mechanisms, inflammasomes, and the induction of parapetosis, a lytic and a special inflammatory cell death. So, Peter, again, thank Thanks, you Karina. for your time <laughs> and uh, for being here. Okay. Even though not uh, present. <laughs> Next time, maybe. Next time. Okay, so thanks, Karina, for the nice introduction and for and and all the organizers for for or for this uh, nice session. I um, you know you have a, a lineup of great speakers here that will cover all aspects of cell death. So can you see my screen? Is that okay? Uh, it's okay. Like this? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, just one moment. Um, I need to. I, I see everybody on, on my screen hiding <laughs> the, the 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 slides. So let me. Okay, I go into laser point. Okay, so today um, I want to talk uh, about a peculiar type of cell death, which is called paraptosis. Um, which I'll show you some pictures, how that works on a molecular level, how that looks when cells undergo paraptosis. And this type of cell death is, is linked to uh, inflammasomes, um, which are innate immune uh, signaling complexes. So um, a little bit an overview of what we will cover today. So we'll start uh, very quickly just with you know, a, a primer into innate immunity and pattern recognition receptors before moving on to the inflammasomes. And I'll introduce you to the different types of inflammasomes that um, we, we know that are known uh, at the moment. And, um, and then I'll highlight a little bit how such an uh, inflammasome is, is assembled and what's the structure of such an inflammasome on, the, on, on one or two examples and how this signals. And um, we'll then go on to, to a, a special subset of inflammasomes, which are called the non-canonical inflammasomes as well. So having um, covered that, we will then come to uh, the consequences of inflammasome activation, which is eventually this type of cell death, which is the focus um, today, paraptosis, and also the associated uh, cytokine release. Um, we will be talking about the gasdermin proteins, which are the executor of paraptotic cell death, um, a little bit lytic and sublytic roles of gasdermin. If there is time, there's a new player, Ningerin one, which uh, I want to mention quickly. And finally, I would like to, to end also on the notion, what is the physio physiological relevance for paraptosis or inflammasomes in immunity? Because this, this is a cell that, that is uh, linked to the immune response. So, um, you know, I've, I've seen that in this program, you will be covering a lot of different types of cell death. And many of them are actually linked to infection. And you can see that here. So of course, during infection, you can have apoptosis, which you heard uh, about, I think from Seamus already, necroptosis, which will be covered um, also by Peter uh, van der Nabele, uh, maybe ferroptosis, I don't know, nettosis, 
Um, but pyroptosis, uh, which is shown here, is uh, I would say you know really the cell that 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 is most strongly linked to infectious diseases or to the immune response to infectious diseases. So um, what uh, you know in what context do we get pyroptosis um, engagement? So para, uh, the inflammasomes that that induce pyroptosis are part of the innate immune uh, response. Um, as you know, uh, pathogens are recognized by innate immune cells, uh, for example, like macrophages here by so-called pathogen uh, pattern recognition receptors, which can be either membrane associated um, as it's shown here or um, in endosome, endosomal compartments. So this would be, for example, the toll-like receptors or the C-type lectin receptors. Uh, but they can also be um, cytosolic, as shown here, like the knot-like receptor um, types of, of uh, uh, PRRs. Now, um, upon uh, recognition of uh, pathogen infection, um, often this is a binding of a pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or PAMP, to these receptors, they will engage a signaling pathway that will, in the end, um, result in the onset of an inflammatory response of cytokine production and inflammation. Now, when we talk about uh, pyroptosis and inflammasomes, we are focusing mostly on those receptors here, so cytosolic uh, receptors, and um, not on a transcriptional response, um, but more um, on, on, a, uh, on, on a different type of response. So in this case, it's the activation of caspases. So um, this is what, we, what we'll focus on today. Um, and these caspases can drive two things. So they drive inflammation and they also uh, cause cell death. So uh, the, the complex that, that I want to explore today is, so, is called the inflammasome or the inflammasome pathway. Um, you can see that here. So we distinguish um, roughly between a canonical and a non-canonical pathway. And we'll start with uh, the, the canonical pathway uh, first. So the canonical pathway um, is uh, engaged or activated when uh, receptors, cytosolic pattern recognition receptors here, um, detect the infection with a pathogen, uh, as shown here, um, by, by recognizing PAMs, for example, or endogenous danger signal that can be, for example, liberated upon infection of a pathogen. So this can be for stress signals um, that are caused um, or, or created by a pathogen infection. Now, there's a couple of different receptors here. So at the moment, um, we usually, uh, there's five confirmed inflammasomes, uh, inflammasome forming receptor, NLRP1, NLRP3, NLRC4, pyrin, and N2. But many more has been proposed to also form inflammasomes, but there a little bit more confirmation is probably necessary until it, it is uh, more widely accepted in, in the field. Now, upon engagement, these receptors will assemble what is now called the inflammasome complex. So it's a multi-protein complex that consists of the receptor and adapter protein here in red, which I'll talk about uh, later as well, which is called ASC. And this uh, complex will activate eventually caspase one shown here as these blue Pac-Man symbols. And um, the caspase, which is a protease, will cleave um, on one hand cytokine. So this is its, its uh, first function that has been identified. So it cleaves um, IL-1 family cytokines like IL-1 beta and IL-18 and promotes their release. So this needs to be, need to be cleaved to be able to be, to be bioactive because in their pro form, um, they cannot bind to the receptor, so the, the pro-domain needs to be cleaved off by the caspase to make this cytokines active. And more interesting for today, um, the caspase will also, will also cleave this protein here, gasdermin D, which will eventually cause uh, paraptotic uh, cell death, which uh, is a, a lytic um, type of cell that where the membrane eventually ruptures. Now, just quickly also to highlight, so this is the non-canonical pathway here, um, a different caspase gets engaged, so caspase 4 in humans and caspase 11 in mice. And the, the factor here that activates this pathway is lipopolysaccharide. And I'll come to a little bit later to this in detail. So um, maybe just as a reminder, what are these proteases that are activated um, by the inflammasomes? Um, so these are caspases, 
which means this cysteine-dependent aspartate-directed proteases. So they have an active site cysteine, which is usually found in the large domain here in, in dark purple, and they cleave um, after aspartate residues in their target proteins. So when we talk about inflammasome activation, we cover this part here, so inflammatory caspases. So you have certainly uh, learned that um, we distinguish between apoptotic caspases um, initiator and effector cap bases of apoptosis shown here and inflammatory caspases. So today we'll focus on, on these caspases here. Um, this uh, is probably also known so the caspase um, get cleaved um, to, uh, during activation. So, so there's a separation of the prodomain, the large and the small uh, subunits of, of the caspase. There's a formation of an active heterotetramer here. And um, what is also known from the apoptotic uh, caspase field is that this needs to happen in large uh, protein complexes, as shown here, for example, the APAF1 apoptosome, which activates caspase 9 upon binding um, of cytochrome C in the intrinsic apoptotic pathway, which I guess was covered by Seamus. Okay, so coming uh, back to inflammasomes. So I've, I've told you that uh, canonical inflammasomes are assembled by cytosolic um, receptors. Um, in this case, these receptors um, consist of different uh, domains. So there's like modules that they have. Um, most of these receptors belong to the not-like receptor family, um, which is shown here. Um, there's 23 of those NLRs in humans, more in mice, uh, 34. And they are further subdivided into, into uh, smaller groups here based on, on, on the, the domain that they feature. So um, what is uh, same in all of these is that they um, contain an oligomerization domain. So this is this NBD or nucleotide binding and dimerization domain, um, which uses ATP to oligomerize uh, the protein. They have this leucine rich repeats, um, which in the past have been thought to be involved in the sensing of ligands um, in analogy to, to toll-like receptors, but actually this is, is not the case. Um, uh, in, in most cases, actually it's not the LLR directly sensing, but contributing to the sensing of the ligand. And then um, they have different N-terminal protein-protein uh, interaction domains. So the NLRAs have, um, um, have this CART and an AD domain here. NLRBs have the bacteriovirus inhibitory repeats shown here, NLRCs, a CARD domain, and NLRPs, a pyrin domain. So the CARD and the pyrin domain are important to finally assemble the complex because these are also found in the other components of the inflammasome. So, so the adapter protein of the inflammasome um, called ASC, which is part of the complex, contains both a pyrin and a CARD domain, and also the caspase, which is the effector molecule of the inflammasome complex, contains a CARD domain. So through, um, so these are all death fault, uh, um, uh, death domain, death fault domain, uh, death fault domains that interact with each other. So a pyrin domain can interact with another pyrin domain, and the card can interact with the card. So through these homotypic interactions here, you can build a complex. So um, the NLR can recruit, for example, ASC, and through the card domain of ASC, it can recruit caspase one into the complex, and then the caspase gets dimerized and, and it will activate. Now, these type of domains you can also find in other uh, proteins that will form inflammasome complexes like pyhin proteins, like the AIM2, for example, has this pyrin domain that allows it to recruit ASC, and also this DNA binding domain, the HIN200, and also pyrin, which gave actually the, the name to the pyrin domain um, contains uh, such a domain. Now, although there is now you know, a lot of these, these proteins known that have, in theory, the potential to build inflammasomes, so far only a few of them have been shown to, um, to, to be able to, to build such a complex. So aim two of this group here, pyrin, and a couple of the NLRs. So uh, here, I just want to highlight what these uh, receptor proteins actually recognize, so how, how they get activated. So here um, we are still talking about um, the canonical inflammasomes. So these are inflammasomes that will eventually um, activate caspase one, um, both in humans and in mice. 
And usually also the ligands and, and everything that is sensed by those receptors is similar between humans and mice. So the probably the best studied um, uh, receptor or pathway here is the NLRC4 inflammasomes, which uh, inflammasome which um, employs these NAP proteins. So these are also NLR family proteins to detect uh, bacterial uh, pathogens. So uh, what is sensed is the type three secretion rod and needle, um, or the flagellin protein of an invading uh, bacterial pathogen. Now a similar mechanism, and here. Actually, it's direct binding between those proteins and the, the, the receptors. So it's very similar to TLRs. Um, a similar uh, pro, uh, mechanism of, of detection is actually employed by M2. So M2 is also uh, a protein that can build inflammasomes. Um, and here M2 uh, directly interacts with cytosolic uh, DNA, which can come, for example, from a viral infection shown here or from bacteria that, that rupture in the cytosol and release DNA. So these are very uh, straightforward ways of detecting a pathogen. So you really detect a, a molecule from a pathogen or, or DNA um, from a pathogen. Now, other inflammasomes, they, they employ a little bit different ways of detecting uh, a pathogen, which are more indirect. So for example, NLRP1, which is, is currently studied by many groups, so which has gained a lot of traction in the last two years, um, is, is a very uh, unique protein. So, uh, NLRP1, and this is one way of activating this protein. So here, um, it's for example, activated during uh, by anthrax lethal toxin or lethal factor here. Um, so this protein um, auto cleaves itself. So it has this auto processing site. So it cleaves itself, but the two parts of the protein stay together. And, um, and it serves as a pseudo substrate for a lethal factor, which normally inactivates innate immune signaling by, by inactivating nf kappa b uh, uh, signaling components. So when it's cleaved, it will eventually get uh, degraded. So it will get ubiquitinated at its end terminus and uh, directed towards the proteasome. And since the protein has this auto processing site, um, the end terminal part, uh, the C terminal part, will actually be during the, uh, be liberated when the end terminus is drawn into the proteasome and released, and it will form an inflammasome complex. So what? So it, it is basically a way of indirectly sensing the protease activity of lethal factor. So there's no direct binding of lethal factor, it's just a substrate of lethal factor. So it's a very, a, quite a unique and interesting way of, of detecting a pathogen. A little bit as a, also an indirect way is employed by the, the fourth inflammasome, pyrin, um, which is shown here. So the, so the the pyrin protein is normally kept inactive, so it's phosphorylated and bound to 14-3-3 proteins shown here, so it's in an inactive form. And, and um, this uh, phosphorylation is driven by PNK1 and 2, these uh, kinases here, that are under the control of Rho A. And uh, it has been shown that during infections, for example, with bacteria or um, bacterial toxins uh, that inactivate Rho A will, will lead to a loss of PNK mediated phosphorylation, and then the protein will activate and form an inflammasome. So, basically, what it senses or is the inactivation or pathogen driven inactivation of the Rho A uh, GTPase um, in this case. So, there's no direct interaction with any bacterial toxins or effectors, it's all indirect sensing. And finally, the most complicated inflammasome, the most important one is probably NLRP3 shown here. So NLRP3 has a, a sort of a two step activation. So it's first um, requires some priming signals that can be mediated, for example, by TLRs that um, bring it from an inactive state into a inactive primed state. So it's still not active, but at least primed. And then a second signal is received, which uh, seemed to have something to do with the disruption of the Trans-Golgi network, for example, by uh, pore forming uh, toxins or other types of membrane pores and potassium efflux, which will um, then result in a translocation of NLRP3 towards the Trans-Golgi network, also an interaction with a second protein called NEX7 um, on the Trans-Golgi network, um, and this will somehow activate the protein. So this one is uh, still a little bit mysterious. Um, how exactly, what is exactly the signal it senses, but uh, I guess in the next couple of years, we will uh, know more about it. Okay, so these are the, the five uh, best studied canonical inflammasomes that we, at the moment, we understood um, the, the most.
Now, quickly, just uh, before I go deeper into the mechanism of inflammasome activation, I just want to highlight that inflammasomes are really important. Um, so, of course, inflammasomes um, will, through cytokine production and through the cell that co cause inflammation, which in most cases, of course, is beneficial. So, for example, if you have an infection with a pathogen, pathogen this is inf uh, this is uh, beneficial, so it would allow the body to clear the infection um, with the pathogen. And indeed, inflammasome deficient mice, when infected with you know, a number of, of bacteria, viruses, parasites, are highly susceptible to these uh, infectious stimulus. However, there's of course uh, a dark side to this as well. Uh, inflammasomes uh, are uh, a really good known driver of chronic inflammation, which is uh, detrimental. So in this case, you have too much paraptosis, too much cytokine production going on. And so over the last decade, um, paraptosis and inflammasome have been linked to many human diseases, um, ranging from neurodegenerative diseases, sepsis, uh, cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, and what you have in those cases um, are either mutations in, uh, in those inflammasome centers, so gain of function mutations like in CAPS, um, Mediterranean fever or macrophage activating syndrome. So in this case, um, the receptor, which is normally inactive, um, has a gain of function mutation that, that makes it constantly uh, active and signal and, and it always assembles an inflammasome. And uh, these patients have uh, too much cytokine production and inflammation in their bodies, uh, often a skin rash and, and things like that. It can also, in some kids, uh, can lead to death eventually. Um, so this is one way where the, the inflammasomes uh, cause disease. And uh, in others, for example, in uh, Park, Alzheimer, Parkinson's or atherosclerosis is often NLRP3, which is involved, which senses uh, sterile inflammatory triggers. Um, or gout, for example, um, here you have um, uric acid crystals that activate NLRP3 without the presence of an infectious agent. So it's, and it uh, basically the inflammasomes get activated, they produce cytokines and this causes inflammation in the context of these diseases. So I'll be not talking about uh, this, I'll go more on the molecular mechanisms here, but, but it's just to highlight how important inflammasomes is. So there's a lot of interest from, from pharma to actually target and inhibit inflammasomes and paraptotic cell deaths to, to help these patients. Okay, so um, I'd like to go a little bit into the structure and assembly and structure of the inflammasome. So uh, as illustrated in this case by the NAPE NLRC4 complex, which is, uh, I would say, uh, by far the best understood inflammasome on the molecular level. So, um, so let's start with, with the history a little bit. So what is, what is NLRC4? Um, so NLRC4 is a protein that was first reported actually by Al Nemery's group in 2001. And at that time it was called IPAF. So it was in this paper here in JBC. So IPAF, its original name stands for ice protease activating factor. So ice protease is the old name of caspase one. So it's a caspase one activating factor. And it was identified on sequence similarity to APAF1 um, to the apoptotic protease activating factor one, which um, builds the, the apoptosome. So the apoptosome um, is this complex here that, the, that is assembled upon uh, sensing of cytochrome C in the cytosol. So um, where's the similarity here? So here you can see um, APAF1. So APAF1 contains this CAR domain and BRK and this uh, um, WD40 uh, repeats, and uh, through the card it can interact with caspase uh, 9 and activate caspase uh, 9. And that path indeed um, looks very similar. So it has this card domain and NAC domain or this NBD, that's another name um, for the domain, and leucine rich repeats instead of the uh, WD40 repeats. And it can interact with caspase 1 through the card domain. So um, at this time, um, it was, uh, was clear that IPAF, uh, or through this publication, was clear that IPAF has sort of the ability to activate caspase 1, um, but whether it builds a similar complex like uh, APAF1 does, and what would be the factor that this, this sensor um, is sensing um, was unknown. So that was 2001, and a couple of years later, um, not 2044, but 2004, sorry. Um, Vishwa Dixit's 
lab um, reported um, uh, in, a, in a paper in Nature that IPATH activates caspase 1 upon the infection of macrophages, for example, with bacterial uh, pathogens. So they used, in this case, um, Salmonella typhimurum, which we will encounter a uh, lot today. So here you can see um, I, wild type cells, so IPATH positive and IPATH deficient cells that are infected with Salmonella for different time points. So this is data from that paper, and you'll see the, the caspase gets activated. So we get the generation of the cleaved P20 subunit here, which is a sign of caspase activation, and you don't get that in the knockouts. And also in the supernate, and you can also measure the release of mature IL-1, so the cleaved form of the cytokine, so, which is cleaved by the caspase, and you cannot get that in the IPATH knockouts. Um, they also looked at cell death induction um, by measuring uh, uh, cell lysis. So this was done um, using LDH release. So uh, LDH is lactide hydrogenase, which can be measured in, in the supernatant of, of lysing cells and, and as a readout sort of for, for cell death or lytic cell death or cell lysis. So in this case, um, you can see that the blue ones, wild type cells die very quickly after salmonella infection and the cell that goes up and the IPATH knockouts um, do, don't die that quickly. So that's the red curve. Now, NLRC4 is a little bit a special sensor. So it uh, doesn't have a pyrin domain, but has a card domain. So the ASC, the adapter that usually links the receptor to the caspase is, is not fully required. And you can see that, that there is a delay here in the green um, ASC knockouts. Um, so it can also work somehow without uh, the ASC protein. So that was uh, a very nice paper at that time, um, suggesting that some bacterial factors activate are sensed by IPAP during an infection. But what is actually the exact nature of this ligand? So uh, again, a couple of years later, in 2006, um, were actually two independent uh, publications here from um, Ed Miao at that time and um, from the lab of uh, uh, Gabriel Nunez also. Um, that show that, that actually cytosolic flagellin is the, the protein that activates caspase 1 via NLRC4. Um, and they show that by using a mutant of salmonella um, that lacks flagellin. So that would be this fly C FLG, FLJB mutant here, or that lacks a type 3 secretion system called SPI1, which is usually used by, by the pathogens to deliver. Um, uh, effective proteins into cells, um, but that can also pick up sometimes flagellin and deliver flagellin into a cell. So you can see here that when they infect wild type cells with salmonella, different MOIs here, um, they get cell death. And if you, they use a FLYC uh, FLJB mutant that doesn't make any flagellin protein, this is, is strongly attenuated, this induction of IL-1 beta, and even more attenuated here when you use a SPI1 mutant. So their conclusion from these papers was actually that the SPI1 type 3 secretion system accidentally injects flagellin into host cells, and that this flagellin molecule is then detected by the NLRC4. And this was also then later shown by, to happen with other bacteria pathogens like Legionella, which uses a slightly different secretion system called type 4, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa using a type 3. So um, what is the similarity, just quickly, between a type 3 and, and uh, system and flagellum. So as I said, these secretion systems are, are basically virulence associated inject, you know, inject, uh, inject, uh, injection apparatus. So it's like a syringe that the bacteria use to deliver um, proteins into cells and which can manipulate cell signaling in the advantage of the bacterium. Now, um, you can see here the flagellum and, and here a type 3 secretion system. And you can already see that this is very similar. So you have uh, a very similar basal structure that is embedded in the bacterial membranes here, outer and inner bacterial membrane. A little, and here you have the flagellin on the outside and here you have a hollow needle on the outside. And so it's, it's, they have a common origin, uh, origin, these structures. So that's why sometimes the flagellin a protein that is building this flagellum here is picked up by this and delivered accidentally into host cells, and that would activate IPATH. So that's uh, the theory um, that um, that one has on how flagellin actually ends up being in the cytosol of host cells. Yeah, so flagellum apparatus and type 3 are closely related and can pick up uh, substrates of each other. 
So what is what is also nice about um, about this is that uh, only bacterial pathogens that uh, use this type of uh, the secretion systems. So uh, uh, commensal normally doesn't manipulate its host cells, so it doesn't use any type of secretion apparatus. So it's it's a way to do, to detect uh, a bacterium based on its its pathogenic activity because it uses these type of of uh, secretion systems. Now. Um, is actually uh, flagellin the only molecule detected by, by uh, NLRC4 or IPAF? So I showed you this data already. So in this case, um, uh, macrophages were infected by, by wild-type salmonella or a fly C mutant or a spy one deficient mutant. So spy one is this, this secretion system here in red. Um, and what you can see is that actually there's a difference here between the fly C uh, mutant and, and the spy one mutant, suggesting that if you lack the secretion system, the effect is much stronger. So there might be something else secreted by um, and ejected by the secretion system. And this is especially evident at, at high MOI here at, at the MOI 60 or 80. And indeed, uh, in 2011, uh, Ed Miaus uh, again showed that in addition to flagellin, um, NLRC4 also recognizes uh, the type 3 secretion uh, rot subunit, which is called PRGJ in, in Salmonella. So if I go back, this is um, there is uh, this is this part here basically um, that is also recognized by NLRC4, and that was done by just expressing this protein in macrophages and it activated NLRC4. And later on, there were papers that also showed that the needle subunit, um, so which is this part here, can also be recognized. So in the end. Um, what we have is uh, several proteins of the, the type 3 secretion apparatus, which is uh, employed by pathogenic bacteria, and also flagellin being recognized by the same protein um, called NLRC4. And this was shown uh, with a number of uh, bacterial pathogens over the years. Okay, so... So that raises, of course, a lot of questions. So, you know, these were very nice data when published, but um, of course, uh, with every publication, you have more questions. Like how does, so this, of course, raised the question, how does NLRC4 recognize three different proteins? So the flagellin protein, the needle protein, and uh, the rot protein of, of, these, um, of these bacteria. So do these proteins all somehow have this, the, a shared motif? It is true that all of these form some kind of polymers. So, so the needle polymer, uh, rot, or, or the flagellin, or is there a, are there other proteins that are involved that are needed for NLRC4? So at that time, so here we are around 2010, when, when these questions uh, came up. Now, um, there was actually some previous observations done uh, mostly in, in, Legion, in Legionella and uh, Salmonella infection that actually explain this quite well. So um, this is work from, from Dario Zamboni, for example, here and from Russell Vance's lab. Um, so what they had observed is that um, another protein um, seems to be sometimes required for NLRC4 activation. So this protein is called NAPE5, um, shown here, or berg one e is another is the old name of this protein, and what uh, these publications showed is that if you would infect um, uh, macrophages with Legionella, um, the response would be completely dependent on, on both NLRC4 and on NAPE5. So you can see that here. So wild type macrophages infected with Legionella um, die, um, so they release LDH, so they die by paraptosis. The NAPE5 knockouts do not and also the NAPE5 and LRC4 knocked out, uh, do not. Um, however, this NAPE5 protein was only partially uh, required during salmonella infection. So the wild type dies here, the NAPE5 knockouts also eventually the cell that will go up and the NAPE5 and LRC4 knockout will stay flat um, as shown here. So this suggested that, uh, that NAPE5 plays an important role um, in the context of some pathogens, but not in not with all um, pathogens, and that it's required for NLRC4 activation. And it was also believed that NAPE5 has the ability to heterooligomerize with NLRC4. But how, how that would work was not entirely clear. Um, now, uh, later work, especially here by, by Russell Vance's lab, um, 
uh, made, made things a little bit more clear. Um, and they showed that for, that NAP5 was not necessary for um, inflammasome activation by PRGJs, which is the rot subunit of, the, of uh, type 3 secretion systems, which you can see here. So the wild type. So if they deliver PRGJ into macrophages, they get um, L1 beta release in wild type in the NAP knockouts, um, but not in the NLRC4 knockouts. While if they deliver fly C, so flagellin, into uh, macrophages, both NAP5 and NLRC4 were necessary. So somehow this suggested that this NAP5 protein was only necessary for the for fly C mediated NLRC4 activation, but not for PERC-J activate, uh, mediated activation. Okay, so what, uh, what is SNAP5 or uh, birk one So the NAP proteins, um, also known as the BERG, BERG proteins are bacteriovirus YAP repeat containing proteins. So we have seen them before. So there's this NLRB group of proteins. Um, they're part of the NLR family. They have a very similar architecture to the, to, to the, uh, to the other NLRs. So also this NBD and uh, the leucine repeats that just have this bacteriovirus in, uh, inhibitory repeats instead of the card domain or the parent domain. Interestingly, um, there's only one NAPE in humans, but seven different NAPEs uh, in mice. Um, but not all of them are expressed in all, uh, all types of mice. So in the black six background, we have only one, two, five, and six that are expressed. So, um, it was also, you know, since people have uh, wondered how NLRC4 can recognize three different ligands, they have, of course, tried to see if there is a direct interaction between NLRC4, flagellin, or the rod subunits. And never, nobody ever has been able to show this direct interaction. So if there's no direct binding, uh, the theory was developed that maybe the NAPES determine the specificity of NLRC4 for its different substrates. And indeed, um, that was finally shown in 2012 by the labs of Russell Vance and Feng Xiao um, independently that basically they showed that the different NAPES um, determine the specificity for the different substrates. So NLRC4 in that case would not be the direct sensor, but it employs upstream sensors that detect these proteins. So for example, mouse NAPE2 detects specifically the ROT subunit, um, mouse uh, NAPE5 and 6 detect flagellin, I think later was shown that NAPE1 of the mouse detects the, the needle subunit. And also the human NAPE can detect some of these proteins. And importantly, the, the NAPEs directly bind to the respective ligand. So the direct interaction here between the NAPEs and the, the bacterial proteins could be shown um, by, by pull down assays and so forth. Okay, so, so I've explained now a little bit like how people came to believe uh, that um, these, the NAPES and the NLRC4 detect these proteins and that these interact directly. So how does the complex finally look that is built um, by the, the NAPE proteins and NLRC4? So the structure, uh, so this is work of course of structural biologists. Um, so many groups have now uh, provided structural data um, on that, the first were um, published actually in 2015. And this was a cryo-EM structure of, of a purified complex between PRGJ, so the rod subunit of uh, salmonella, NAP2 protein of mice, and NLRC4 protein of mice. And what you can see is here is the structure of such a complex. Um, so the, this NAP NLRC4 complex is, is, a, is basically a, a wheel-like assembly with a 10 to 12 fold symmetry. Um, interestingly, it contains only one NAP protein and around nine to 11 molecules of NLRC4. So only the one of those is the NAP and NAP in this case also the NAP is bound to perk J and then there's this other pro, uh, and the rest of the complex is formed by NLRC4. You can see also here the size of the complex around 30 nanometers uh, in diameter um, of this ring. So this is very similar to the apoptosome when you compare it. So the apoptosome has this, heptam is this heptameric complex. Um, but what is different is, of course, that it's more subunits. Um, you, not all of the subunits are the same. So in this averaging here, you can't see the differences between NLRC4 and the NAPE. But in, in later publication, this was shown much clearly that one of those subunits is different in, in its structure. 
Um, and also what is also different that only the NAPE is bound to a ligand, um, while here um, all APAF1 molecules um, are bound to cytochrome C that are, that are in the complex. Now what these papers also revealed is actually how this complex is built. So I'll quickly summarize this. So um, both, uh, so here's a, a more detailed structure of the NAPES and NLRC4 um, shown here with the different domains. And uh, in a more 3D view, this, this looks probably like that. So the, the NAPE and the NLRC4 proteins are actually um, first in an inactive conformation and the leucine rich repeats fold back onto, onto uh, the rest of the protein and basically it's kept inactive like this. Now, once the NAPE proteins, either NAPE5 or five, you know, NAPE2 or 6, bind to their ligands, um, this, this binding of the, uh, in this case, uh, the ROT subunit or flagellin, this will open up this protein. And this reveals here a new interaction site. And through this interaction site, the protein can bind an inactive NLRC4. Um, and this is also shown a little bit here. So this is this new interaction site here um, that is created that can interact with in in inactive uh, molecules. So it in first interacts with an inactive NLRC4. And by this interaction, it induces a conformational change and then the LRC4 will also open up. So that also the leucine rich repeat will open and again, revealing this interface here. And then it can basically do the same thing. So it's like a domino-like effect. So then it again uh, interacts with an inactive NLRC4 molecule and will open up this one as well. And through this, you build step-by-step, step, you build um, finally these ring-like structures. And uh, which uh, I would refer to as, uh, as the receptor complex. And this receptor complex then, once it's assembled, can drive caspase one activation, pyroptosis, and cytokine maturation. So this was um, a little bit, you know, the history of, of NLRC4, of, of this inflammasome here, and up until uh, the formation of the complex. So you see this, this wheel like uh, complexes seem to be. Um, a common theme in cell death, both on, on, on the apoptotic pathway and also um, in, in the more in the inflammatory cell death uh, pathway. And indeed, uh, similar complexes have been revealed uh, at least for some of those proteins. So for example, NLRP3, which is shown here forms, uh, uh, this is work from uh, Hao Wu's lab here, um, forms also a similar type of, of wheel-shaped complex. So in this case, NLRP3, um, first needs to interact with NEC7 um, to, to gain this, this active conformation here. So, and then these uh, subunits oligomerize to form also this type of wheel here. And uh, it works a little bit different for um, M2. So M2 ha is, is a, has a different architecture. So M2 is not an NLR, M2 is a pyene protein. So it only consists of a DNA binding domain and uh, a parent domain, so it lacks this, this uh, NBD domain, so it can, cannot oligomerize by itself. So of course, this, this raises the question, how can it assemble an inflammasome? So what you can see here is the crystal structure of the HIN200 domain in complex with the DNA. So these are the HIN200 domains from the side and the top view. And basically um, what is believed is that, that the DNA uh, or functions as an oligomerization template um, for the receptor. So basically the whole DNA gets covered here by, by two HIN domains. And through that, you have a local concentration of uh, high local concentration of M2 so that the parent domains eventually will be able to cluster and initiate um, caspase one activation and eventually uh, cell death. So it's sort of a, uh, uh, a pseudo-oligomerization induced by the ligand itself. So it's not the receptor oligomerizing, by the, but the ligand allows this, this clustering that is necessary, necessary to initiate uh, the next signaling step. So this, um, of course, brings me you know, to, to, to this question here. So how do these, once this receptor complex is formed, so these wheels-like uh, complexes are formed, how do they activate um, caspase 1? Now, um, what is clear is, um, is one thing is that when you have a receptor complex like this, so this is the NLRP3 complex, one thing that is necessary is that you have a local clustering 
of the protein-protein interaction domain. So in this case, it's, you have these pyrin domains that cluster here and, and that also get unfolded uh, and accessible when, the, when this, this complex is formed. However, when you look at, at, a, at an inflammasome in cells, um, we never see this type of complexes. So this, 30 dia this is 30 nanometers in diameter, this is way too small to see. But what we, we usually in an infected cell that forms an inflammasome, you can see something. And this is uh, shown here. So this is a macrophage infected with salmonella. And in green um, is a structure which we usually refer to as the AASC spec. So um, the, you know, shown here in green. So the ASC spec is, a, a, I would say, is a macromolecular assembly which is formed by the inflammasome adapter ASC. So that's the next step of the pathway. So the, the receptor interacts with the adapter ASC and the ASC forms this structure here. So if you, have, if you are in ASC knockouts, you will never see this type of structures being formed. Um, so how does ASC form something like this? So ASC, you know, this has one to two microns in diameter. So this is a very ma big macromolecular structure. But ASC has only 20 kilodaltons. So it's a very small uh, protein consisting of two 10 kilodalton domains. So how is, what is this structure and how is it assembled? So very quickly uh, here, uh, this, uh, the ASC specs um, are really also a good readout for inflammasome activation. So for example, you can see them in cells. So these are macrophages where we activate NLRP3 has been activated, or you can even see them in, in tissues in vivo. So these are mouse lung tissue from a publication where NLRP3 has been activated and ASC specs are shown in green. So this is a really a good sign of inflammasome uh, signaling if you, if you can see ASC specs. So how do, are the specs formed? So ASC um, consists of two domains shown here in green. So this is a pyrin domain here, the round symbol and the card domain, um, or the star-shaped signal here. And ASC, purified ASC is known to have the ability to polymerize. So it makes filaments. So you can see these filaments either when you um, have uh, purified ASC at high concentrations in vitro here. So you can see, you know, by electron microscopy, this type of filaments being formed or, or this type of filaments formed by just the ASC pyrin domain. So uh, this has been also, uh, the, the structure of these filaments has been solved. So basically what the pyrin domain of ASC does is that it will oligomerize into these helical filaments um, that are shown here through different uh, interaction domains here within the pyrin domain. And this is, a, this is very common to these type of, of death fault domains that they form filamentous assembly. So this can, it's also in apoptotic signaling has been observed as well. And the car domains can do these things as well, not just the pyrin domains. And the death, death affected domains do it and so forth. So um, you can also see that in cells, um, so these are, um, macrophages um, that express either full-length ASC, only the pyrin domain or only the CART domain um, hooked up with fluorescent proteins. So in this case, it's full-length with M-cherry, pyrin domain with M-cherry or CART um, with uh, no, the CART with GFP. And when you treat those macrophages with DNA or ATP, so this activators of N2 and NLRP3, you can get the assembly of these, these spec-like structures. So here is really a focus and you can see that this is this uh, spec uh, is not a round structure, but it has this filamentous appearance. So it's like a cluster of a lot of filaments. And what drives this clustering is, is, is not the pyrin domain. The pyrin domain makes the filaments. But um, if you don't have this, the, the, the card domain, the, the filaments cannot cluster. So it's the card domain that drives the clustering um, of these filaments. So, uh, you know, this has led to the, to the following model. Um, for inflammasome assembly from the beginning to the end. So we, uh, so we start here by, uh, let's say this is the NLRC4 inflammasome here. So ligand binds to, to its first receptor, in this case is the NAPE. This, the NAPEs, as I showed you, will oligomerize NLRC4 and you start by forming this wheel. So this is the top view and the side view. Now in this wheel, um, the protein-protein interaction domains of the receptor will now be free and, and allowed to interact with each other and they form an initial seat for ASC recruitment. ASC is then recruited to those 
uh, seeds here, and it starts to uh, form a, a, a filamentous assembly, as it's shown here, where that is formed by the parent domain of ASC, so the dark green domain. And um, it's believed that the that the, the car domains can be seen on the side of those filaments. And through these car domains, the, these filaments will eventually cluster to form the signaling assembly, which is referred to the ASE spec, which we can see actually in, in, in cells that, uh, that have activated the inflammasome. And also these car domains that are on the side of those filaments um, are believed to initiate um, also uh, the formation of filaments um, of caspase one, um, as shown here. So this is done through the car domain. So the car domain is built of the caspase is believed also to make a filament. And on those, um, the P20 and P10 domains will be brought in close proximity and the caspase will be activated. So that's the model. Not all of these parts of the model have been experimentally confirmed, but um, you know, this is from, from many different publications. This has been uh, brought to center. So what is, is also believed that this, this filament assembly is necessary actually to amplify the signal. So if, if, uh, if only a small complex like this would be formed where you have just um, a receptor wheel, the adapter and immediately recruit the caspase, you cannot recruit a lot of caspase. Uh, you cannot recruit a lot of caspase and not activate a lot of caspase. But if you um, have this filament formation, the, the, the whole filament can serve as a caspase one assembly uh, platform. And this amplifies the signal from, from very few bacterial ligands that are found in the cytosol to get really a strong cell response. Okay, so uh, that was, how am I in time? Okay, so that was the canonical inflammasome pathway here. Um, I would now want to quickly go into the non-canonical pathway here before we come um, to paraplotic uh, cell death. So uh, the non-canonical pathway was discovered or first reported in 2011. Um, that was by Vishwa Dixit's group in Kayagaki Adal here in Nature, um, where they showed that this new inflammasome pathway um, targets caspase 11 instead of caspase 1. And they showed that that during infection with different bacteria, for example, Vibrio cholerae, E. coli, or Citrobacter um, rodentium. Interestingly, this pathway um, was able to induce paraptosis independently of all known inflammasome receptors like NLRC4 and NLRP3, but required NLRP3 for cytokine release. So, uh, you know, this is, this is a little bit the canonical NLRP3 inflammasome. So, uh, you know, different activators like ATP or nigerian can trigger it. So you have NLRP3 that activates caspase 1 through ASC, resulting in R1 beta release and paraptosis. And in this new pathway that was reported at that time, we would have, act, you know, bacteria activating caspase 11 and then caspase 11 somehow activating um, NLRP3 to make R1 beta release. But caspase 11 by itself causing paraptosis. So the details were not entirely clear in that paper at that time, but um, beginning to emerge. Now, follow up experiments um, looked a little bit what is actually the bacterial trigger that causes activation of this pathway. And what was seen very quickly um, by uh, another publication by Vishwa Dixit's lab and by Ed Miao's lab here um, is that. Um, that gram-negative bacteria activate this pathway while gram-positive bacteria do not. So here they transfected gram-negative lysate into cells and you can get an activation here, gray bars, which, is, um, which disappears in the caspase 111 knockouts um, or also disappears in the caspase 11 knockouts, um, but the gram-positive lysates would not activate it. So this suggested that there's something uh, unique to gram-negative bacteria that activates this pathway. And uh, you know, what, what is the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria? It's the presence of LPS. So it was speculated that maybe LPS is the trigger of this pathways. Indeed, that turned out to be true. So um, when they, in, in the same publications, when they transfected LPS into cells, they could observe a strong activation of both uh, cell death here, cytokine release, uh, cell LDH release, and also cytokine release here, L1 beta. Um, in wild type cells, which was gone in the caspase 11 knockouts, um, shown here in the red bars. Also, the lipid A subunit would be able to do that. So the, here is a structure of LPS. So the lipid A is this innermost part 
of of LPS, which is embedded in the in the outer bacterial membrane, and and the rest, mostly the inner outer core and O antigens, are the sugars, um, that that are on the outside, and even that part here um, was sufficient to activate the response. But lipid four A, which is a hexacylated uh, lipid A, so it has instead of having six acyl, uh, um, acyl chains here, it has only four, was not activating it. So so the, the this part here was essential to activate um, this pathway. So in conclusion, the non-canonical inflammasome pathway was found as the main detection mechanism for cytosolic gram-negative bacteria. So if the bacterium invades into cells, it, its LPS will be detected by, by this pathway. Now, having shown that, of course, um, the question uh, that, that arised from that, that uh, from those publications was if there is a dedicated LPS sensor that would be binding caspase 11, uh, that would activate, would be binding LPS and activating caspase 11 as it's found for the canonical inflammasome pathways. Now, uh, a very interesting publication in 2015 showed that this is actually not the case. So this was from Feng Xiao's lab here in this paper in Nature that show that inflammatory caspases are themselves innate immune receptors for intracellular LPS. So what they found is that um, unlike other caspases, uh, caspase 11 or in, in its human counterparts, caspase 4 and 5 work differently. So they have the ability to directly bind LPS. So they don't require a, a sensor, but they directly interact with LPS. And this interaction results in their oligomerization and eventually in the activation of the caspase. So this is a little bit a unique mode so there is no, 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 uh, no, no other protein complex required to um, induce this activation of the caspase. So as shown a little bit here, so the binding will to LPS will oligomerize um, the caspase and the caspase will then be activated. Of course, uh, biology is never that simple. So even here, um, it requires, this pathway requires a couple of other proteins, which I want to highlight here. So work um, by, by many labs, also by, by myself, has shown that um, to activate caspase 11 or caspase 4, um, you also need type 1 interferon signaling. So macrophages that are either, you, know, you can see that here, so these are macrophages infected with salmonella. In this case, they don't express flagellin, so they don't activate caspase 4 and only activate caspase 11. Um, wild type macrophages infected with these salmonella activate cell death. Caspase 11 knockouts do not, but also um, macrophages that either uh, don't, res they don't respond to type 1 interferon, like IFNA knockouts or STAT1 knockouts, um, do, not be, uh, do not induce any uh, cell death. So this indicated that one or several interferon stimulated genes are necessary for efficient non canonical inflammasome activation. And over the years, this then led to the identification of a group of proteins that seem to be required. To, to engage the non-canonical pathway, which are called the guanylate binding proteins or the GBPs. So these are um, a family of large GTPases that is found in mouse and in humans. Um, they are induced by type one or type uh, two interferons. They um, are important for host defense against bacteria and parasites. Um, you can see them here. So they consist, um, they have the stalk-like domain and this GTPase domain shown here. Um, how they function is not really clear. So they are related to dynamics, which are protein that can remodel uh, membranes. But what is clear is that they are very important for non canonical inflammasome activation. So here is just an, an example of mouse macrophages that are infected with gram-negative bacteria, so Salmonella or Citrobacter. And in gray, we have wild type macrophages and in red uh, chromosome three knockout macrophages. And you can see that there is a reduction of cell death and there's also less caspase activation in the chromosome three knockout. So basically here in the chromosome three knockouts, we lack all of the GBPs on, on chromosome three of the mouse. So they're important for inflammasome, uh, non-canonical inflammasome activation. Um, this year, there have been some data that, that explain a little bit how the how the these GBPs function. So it was actually shown by, by us and others the GBP1 has the ability to interact with LPS um, directly on the surface of a, of a cytosolic uh, pathogen. So in this case, you know, this is from, from a review, um, you would have a bacterium like salmonella that invades the cytosol 
It is then first covered by these, these GBP proteins. Um, so GBP1 binds to LPS and recruits the rest of the GBP. So it recruits four, G, four GBPs built in a complex, GBP1, 2, 3, and 4 on the surface. And this platform that is then built on the surface of the bacterium recruits somehow caspase-4 and somehow caspase-4 is then activated, which can then cleave casdermin D and kill the, the infected cell. Um, this actually you can see that very nicely. So here, um, this is uh, gfp tag caspase-4. You can see here in green that is recruited to, to salmonella here um, that, in, that are um, used to infect those cells here. But it will require more work to actually know how, actually, if this is sort of a type of inflammasome that is built on the salmonella surface, or if, if these are two separate complexes, um, that, the, the, there is all, that the GBPs play more of an indirect role in allowing the caspase to interact with the LPS on, on salmonella. Okay, so that um, was all I want to say about the formation and the signaling of inflammasome. So we have uh, explored a little bit the canonical pathway in the formation of these, those wheel-shaped wheel uh, assemblies and, and also uh, the, the non-canonical pathway in a couple of words. So I would now go uh, to the question of the molecular mechanism that un, uh, underlying peripatetic cell death and the cytokine release or to the question of how actually the inflammatory caspases kill cells, but if there are, you know, we can do questions now or, or later, if there are questions on this so, part. So Peter, there's a question from the YouTube. Uh, yeah. So it's from Leonardo Fontora, uh, and he asks, does other, uh, or do other secretion systems of bacteria mm -hmm. um, activate the inflammasome? For example, the autotransporter secretion system, mm -hmm. which is present yeah. in many pathogenic bacteria. Um, that's a very good question. So um, this has been tested to, to some degree. I think the autotransporters um, has been tested. The, the type 6 secretion system has been tested. I don't know if you, uh, for those who know those, so the type 6 are these, these lens-like structures that, you know, are, are, are used to, to either you know, during infection of cells or interbacterial warfare, but these don't seem to um, activate uh, so far any um, inflammasomes. There has, no, there has been no reports. Hi, so Peter. Said... Uh, my question is related to NLRC4 inflammasomes. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, they are uh, described uh, in other situation, like uh, during fungal infection. So mm -hmm. fungal infection mm -hmm. does, does have, fungi does have, doesn't have uh, flagellin or yeah. T3 SS mm -hmm. proteins. Yeah. yeah, that's a, you like, you know, like could, there, could there be more ligands, right? Yeah, could there be, um, I would not exclude it, right? Because at the, it is possible that, you know, like the, the NAPE seem to be specific for the bacteria derived factors. Mm -hmm. But at this point, we cannot exclude that, for example, the NAPEs are also able to sense a protein from, from a fungal infection. This we cannot exclude, or that a, a yet unknown group of, of proteins would have the same function as the NAPE. Um, which is to, to bind uh, uh, a pathogen-derived ligand and initiate NLRC4 activation. So this we cannot exclude. Or neither can we exclude that NLRC4 could have a direct ligand that would allow it to, to oligomerize and form a complex. So at, at, uh, at this point, it's absolutely possible. Or some uh, cytosolic pathways that regulate this, uh, how can I say, uh, molecular conformation of mm -hmm. the NAPE and, and LR support. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's possible. You know, the question is also, could there be an endogenous, lig endogenous ligand for, for the NLRC4 inflammasome? It has, there have been reports also suggesting activation of NLRC4 in the brain, right? Um, even mm -hmm. independent of infections. So maybe, the, maybe there's some, maybe this receptor first developed as a, as a receptor for an endogenous danger signal and only later on gain the ability through the napes to also sense pathogens. Mm 
Yes, thank you. I also have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, uh, is there any data or do you believe that different inflammasomes um, work together as a cascade? Mm -hmm. I'm not asking about things in the same ligand or the same mm -hmm. pattern. I'm yeah. saying about working together, like one favor the other or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, yeah, so there's, at least for NLRC4, there has been reports that it sort of interacts with, with NLRP or works together with NLRP3. Um, um, it is possible that the NLRP3 is, is, is often used to amplify a first activation of, of, the, uh, of an inflammasome. So this is especially clear in the non-canonical pathway. So the non-canonical pathway will activate caspase 11, but caspase 11 by itself cannot cleave any cytokines, right, shown here. So it can only cleave gasdermin D. But, but the lysis uh, or the pores formed and eventually by gasdermin D, which I'll, I'll talk about later, result in a potassium efflux that activates then NLRP3 as a sort of a second wave. And uh, that will activate caspase 1 to cleave the cytokines. And this has also been shown, I think, I think by Dario some, uh, had a paper on AIM2 activation during pathogen infection, where a low level of AIM2 inflammasome activation was then amplified by a second wave of NLRP3 activation. So the, so the uh, there is indeed uh, the possibility that that they that uh, that they work together, and especially NLRP3 acts sort of uh, as an amplificator of the response. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, there are a few other questions. Some mm -hmm. I think we're gonna approach later when you talk mm -hmm. about that. Sure. So I'm gonna leave them uh, to yep. the end. But there are a couple of. Uh, uh, of questions, one regarding, I think a follow up, what Karina is saying about. So, you're talking about bacteria, Kar Karina, yep. you know, ask about fungus, and then some people are wanting to know about viruses, you know, mm -hmm. how they are, if they are yep. recognized by those systems. Mm -hmm. And another, this, uh, another question involves, um, you know, how the, how the involvement of GBPs in the mm -hmm. non canonical inflammasome was discovered. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. that's okay. that you, um, that's yeah, so, so the, for the first question, yes, of course, you, you have viral activators of this pathway as well. I think most obvious would be AIM2. So this is a DNA sensor, which can sense uh, DNA from, from viral pathogens. Now, um, also emerging now is NLRP1. So NLRP1, as I showed you this example where it's activated by cleavage by um, lethal factor from, from anthrax. But as you know, uh, many viral pathogens involve uh, proteases that, um, that need to cleave pro proteins of the virus. And uh, it has now been shown last year in a publication um, that these viral proteases sometimes also cleave NLRP1 and activate um, the NLRP1 inflammasome. And for the second question, so on the GBPs, um, so the GBPs, uh, how were the GBPs identified? Basically, it was known that um, some uh, interferon-induced genes seem to be necessary to get this pathway going. And... Uh, at least in my, in my lab, uh, or together with, uh, with a collaborator, we performed basically an siRNA screen where we knocked down every interferon-induced gene to, to identify which ISGs were actually required for the pathway to work. So this was uh, a screening approach. Thank you. Uh, a final question, Peter. Um, mm -hmm. Can you comment a little bit more on why do we see only one mask spec per cell usually? Yeah. Uh, very good question. So this, I think, is bothering many people, <laughs> and it's a little bit hard to explain. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, from from what has been published, it appears to be a, a kinetic thing. So, um, you know, during an infection, you know, you might have a different spots in the cells, um, uh, receptors that are activated. Um, but um, the first receptor that is activated and is build, able to build this, the, the wheel um, will act as a cellular sink for all ASC because we'll immediately start to polymerize all ASC um, in the cell so that other receptor wheels that are formed eventually don't have actually time to, 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 uh, to build an ASC spec. 
So uh, I think this is, this is the best explanation because this polymerization AAC spec assembly happens within five or 10 minutes. So the first one wins and builds the AAC spec. So probably um, you have other of these wheel-shaped complexes in the cell as well, but only one appears as an ASC spec. I hope that answers. Yeah, I, I do have a question about that. Mm -hmm. So for how long do you think uh, this uh, ASC spec stays active in the cell? So mm -hmm. it's usually used for identifying inflammasome activation. Mm -hmm. So are there a timing that it's more uh, appropriate for you to, mm -hmm. to find it or not in the cell? So usually it's, it's very stable. So it has a, basically, usually the, the cell dies afterwards and the spec stays. It's not disassembled. And it has also been proposed that the specs are released from cells and can be taken up by other um, macrophages, for example, and this amplifies the inflammatory response. So it's a, it's, it's a structure that doesn't seem to be degraded um, afterwards. And actually, even if you, for example, if you take a, a caspase deficient cell, it will assemble an ASE spec, but not die. But the specs will stay on. It will not, they will not be degraded, at least during, you know, one 12 to 24 hours where we have watched cells, the specs stayed, but didn't do that much. So, you know, it, it is meant to eventually kill the cell. So there, there is, there is no um, degradation mechanism for the spec that is uh, sort of uh, expected to happen. Okay, and also another mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Uh, I know that you have just explained that, but I think that I still haven't understand that uh, mm -hmm. well. Uh, you mentioned that you, you do believe that type 1 interferon mm -hmm. uh, is stimulating the production or the activation of these uh, GPPs proteins, mm -hmm. is that correct? Um, so, yeah, so this was a little bit uh, fast here. So the, the GPPs, um, so, so type 1 interferon will make, uh, induce the expression of the GBPs. Um, so for example, during an infection, your cell will, you know, the cells will, will be, you know, experience type 1 interferon or, or type 2 interferon, they will upregulate GBP. So they will be sort of in a primed state for an infection. So now at the time when a bacterium invades those cells and ends up in the cytosol, the GBPs will recognize this bacterium. And at least for the human GBPs, we know that GBP1 is the, the, the key here. So GBP1 has the ability to interact with LPS um, and because LPS is very strongly negatively charged. And this allows GBP1 to interact with the, with GBP, uh, with the LPS and they recruit the other GBPs to build sort of a, a shell of GBPs around the bacteria. And this complex of GBPs has probably, and this is, this is the current model, a membrane destabilizing activity that it allows to disrupt this outer membrane of the bacteria and um, allows the caspase eventually to gain access to the lipid A portion of LPS. Peter, yeah. it, it just came to my mind that, uh, what about when uh, people try in, in vitro, just pro giving LPS itself, there's no wall, yeah. there's no bacteria, how does yeah. it work then? Um, it's also uh, in our hands and in other people's hands, it's GBP dependent. So. But, uh, so in, in vitro, you mean, you, you mean um, transfect LPS, for example, into a cell yeah, or yes, yes, Yeah, yes. so if you transfect LPS, it's still GBP dependent. And the reason for it is that uh, what you, LPS is highly, uh, you know, uh, polar, right? So, so it, uh, uh, sorry, highly, highly hydrophobic. So it, uh, there, you don't have single molecules of LPS floating around. So it will always make a, a micelle-like aggregate to hide its hydrophobic part. So even if you just transfect LPS, um, it will be delivered to the cell as form in the form of a micelle that is, is basically like an outer membrane of a bacterium. And you require the GBP for the caspase to get access to the LPS. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay, should I go on? Everyone asked the question, so I'm gonna ask as well. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, 
the interior from uh, it has mm -hmm. been a while since I read those papers, mm -hmm. but uh, if I remember correctly, the interferon mm -hmm. signaling was first shown to be important because it upregulated GBP and that led it to vacuolization, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, at the, vacuolar at rupture or... Point, yeah, vacuolar uh, rupture. But at this point we are right mm -hmm. now, is it still necessary uh, type 1 interferon signaling to regulate GBP functioning, mm -hmm. plamazam activation, or is, are there other signals that might... Um, so, so about the vascular, so... Well, because you can have inflammasome mm -hmm. activation without type 1 interference signaling, correct? Yeah, so, so this depends on which inflammasome you look at, right? So the right. non-canonical pathway doesn't really work without, doesn't efficiently work without the GBPs and, and prior priming with type 1 or type 2 interference. But the other pathway here, they are, to my knowledge, actually independent of interferon priming. Okay. And interferon will even uh, yeah. downregulate NLRP, the NLRP3 inflammasome. So, so interferon is not so always. So you cannot bypass interfer uh, interferon mm. signaling. No, so, interferon so what what you can do is if, if you if you basically in a naive cell, and we have done that, is is you artificially express the GBPs. Right. Um, then you can regain non-canonical inflammasome activation and caspase recruitment and, gaster and cell death, um, even in absence of interferon priming okay. for, for this pathway. So you can basically express GBP1, 3, and 4, and that's mm -hmm. sufficient to get this, this arm of, of inflammasome activation going during an infection. So then you don't need the interferon. So which shows nicely that it's actually the interferon is only needed to get the GBPs expressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second question, do you, um, do you think that you could have that tonic interference signaling. If you mm -hmm. believe that that's enough for GBP upregulation yeah. or it's not the case, what's your view on that? I'm not sure. Yeah, it so it depends, uh, it depends on the cell type. So in macrophages, for example, human macrophages, it is known that there's relatively high basal level of GBP expression that a lot of, that actually priming is not necessary to get a GBP dependent response. Yeah. Okay. In other cells, is, 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 is basically there's no GBP expressed, and then once you treat with interferon, then you have them, yeah. The last one, I promise. So yeah. it's a very hypothetical question, but can we expect a more uh, intense response or a more, I don't know, in the context of uh, a co-infection, for example, in a mm -hmm. viral infection mm -hmm. with also a bacterial infection, hypothetically, like mm -hmm. COVID, for example, yeah. when we know that patients, mm -hmm. they have a viral infection, but usually mm -hmm. they also have uh, mm -hmm. bacterial yeah. infection in the yeah. lungs. A secondary bacterial so I infection, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say yes, uh, but it depends a little bit on, on probably on which pathway is then involved. So, uh, you know, the, the best example would be, for example, you know, if, if the virus would induce a strong interferon response, um, how would that affect then the, the, the activation of inflammasome by the bacteria, right? So in the case of the non-canonical pathway, that could be beneficial, right? Because that would basically prime the cells to make GBPs and be ready for a bacterial infection. In other pathways, for example, NLRP3, which is negatively regulated by interferon, it might be detrimental. So th that depends probably then on which pathway gets activated by the bacteria, whether it, it amplifies or, or, or blocks the response. I hope that answered the question. Good. Should I go on, Gustavo? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yep. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So cell death. Let's uh, get into that. So, um, you know, so I said the, the basically what happens at the end once the caspases are activated is paraptosis. So what is what is paraptosis? So paraptosis. Um, actually, the first observations of paraptosis go back already into the uh, into the eighties. So eighty six and ninety two are the first papers that report uh, in macrophages something that is that we now know it was paraptosis. At that time, they they talked about uh, a special form of pathogen induced apoptosis that was seen in those cells. 
Um, but the name paraptosis was only uh, then coined in 2001 by Brad Cookson and co-workers um, to distinguish really this type of, of pathogen-induced death from the regular apoptosis pathway. So um, the, 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 the syllables here, pyro and ptosis, derive from the Greek roots pyro, which means heat and fever, and ptosis uh, basically falling off. So this is the uh, death, uh, which just highlights sort of the inflammatory nature of this uh, cell death. And initially, was not much was known, so it was shown then all, with time that it requires caspase 1 and doesn't require the apoptotic caspases, uh, independent of part 1 and DNA cleavage. And uh, what was quite striking is that it involved some kind of osmotic swelling and lysis. And this I want to highlight here in this movie. So this is a cell that will undergo paraptosis. And when I run it, you'll see that there's this enlargement of the membrane and this, this, this ballooning. You have the nucleus that condenses and the organelles are basically clustered here close to the nucleus. And the, in blue is, is um, an X in five. So the cell gets an X in five positive uh, and will be eventually also a phagocytosed. So uh, just to highlight this, that this is different than other types of cell death. So here we have a comparison of cells dying by paraptosis, necroptosis, and apoptosis. If I run these movies, you'll see that morphologically this is different, right? So the paraptotic cell has these large ballooning membranes. The necroptotic cell is more uh, rounding up, but otherwise looks sort of similar, but not that much ballooning. And the apoptotic apoptotic cells, of course, very different. So the apoptotic cells will form nice apoptotic bodies that you can see here. And also the nucleus will be then put into one large apoptotic body usually. So you can just, just morphologically, this, this death looks um, very peculiar, very different. Um, although both paraptosis and necroptosis are lytic types um, of cell deaths, but they, the cells don't look um, the same. So um, our understanding of paraptosis changed really tremendously in 2015 when two papers were published, um, one uh, from Feng Shao's lab here and, and one from uh, Vishwa's lab, um, both in nature, that identified uh, this protein gasdermin D, which is required for paraptotic cell death. And um, they used a little bit different approaches. So Feng used a CRISPR screen in, in macrophages and uh, Nobu, um, in his paper, he used the ENU mutagenesis in mice, but they basically came to the same conclusion that, um, that, to, uh, um, that uh, this gasdermin protein is required to induce uh, paraptotic cell death after either the canonical or the non-canonical uh, pathway. So they also showed that the caspases cleave uh, the protein and that the N-terminus of gasdermin D um, is, is freed after cleavage and induces paraptosis. So maybe um, a step back, what is gasdermin D? So gasdermin D is a 53 kilodalton protein uh, that has two domains, which we refer to usually as the gasdermin N term and the C term. And these are con connected by, by an unstructured linker. And the name gasdermin derives from its uh, initial of, of uh, the expression of, of one of the family members, gasdermin A in the gastrointestinal tract and the dermis. So, so there's, uh, gasdermin D is part of a, of a protein family called the gasdermin. So this has six members in humans and 11 in mice. And the first one that was actually identified you know, 20 years ago was gasdermin A expressed in, um, in the, the GI tract and the dermis. So um, a little bit different numbers uh, between humans and mice, but basically the same structure for all of these proteins an N-terminal domain, a linker, and a C-terminal domain. So what did they show in, this, in these papers from, from Feng Shao and Vishva Dixit? I just want to highlight some of the key data here. So they were showed, for example, that um, gasdermin-deficient um, uh, macrophages, um, similarly to caspase-11-deficient macrophages, do not respond to LPS or lipid A transfection by inducing cell deaths. So you can see that here. So here they transfected LPS or lipid A. There's no response um, in the black bars, caspase 11, but also no response in two lines of gasdermin D knockouts um, was very clear in the wild type response by cell death induction. And also uh, gasdermin D is required for R1 beta release. So there's R1 beta release here in the wild type, but not in the knockouts. Um, then uh, they also showed that for the canonical inflammasome activation, so he, here they compare wild-type macrophages to gasdermin knockouts with a number of different activators of inflammasomes. So um, basically, ROG subunit here, BSK and flagellin, 
um, digericin and another tree activated uh, um, toxin, um, Clostridium toxin B here, a pyrin activator, AIM2 activated DNA, and again, the non-canonical pathway. And you can see very clearly that the Casdermin D knockouts do not induce cell death after both canonical and non-canonical inflammasome activation. And a very important uh, and cytokine release is also um, reduced in, in those. A very important finding actually was that Casdermin D gets processed during, during inflammasome activation. So here is a blot from those papers. Um, so here uh, are macrophages from different genotypes, um, unstimulated, this is the control. So there's Casdermin D is in its pro form here or full length present in the wild type and caspase 11 knockouts, not present in Casdermin D knockouts. And after LPS transfection, so engagement of the non-canonical inflammasome, you get the appearance of this P30 fragment here um, of Casdermin D. And this doesn't happen in the caspase 11 knockouts. Um, and similar data were also the, obtained then for the canonical pathway. So suggesting that the protein is uh, cleaved by the caspase um, during, um, during inflammasome activation. And they also identified the cleavage site. So they did some muta uh, mutational analysis. And so here they complement knockout macrophages with either wild type gasdermin D. So the wild type form gets processed. P30 appears here. And the, um, if they uh, have the, if they mutate the aspartate 276 to, a, to an alanine, there is no cleavage of gasdermin D anymore. So it's, it seems that there, there is an aspartate where the inflammatory caspase is cleave and thereby um, activate uh, the, the Casdermin D protein. So um, how do these frag or, or which of these fragments that is generated after uh, caspase cleavage uh, actually kills the cell? Um, this was also addressed in those papers. So when you just take, um, I think in this case it was HeLa or Hex cells, um, and express full length Casdermin D that was, that was this here. You don't get any cell death if you just express the end terminus. So one to 276 um, cells die. And if you just express the C terminals, um, the cells do not die. So suggesting that the killing, ability, killing activity of the protein is in this end terminal fragment. So we have a situation like here where um, the end terminus is a paraptosis triggering domain of Casdermin D, um, which is connected via this linker to the C-term domain, which is a repressor domain. So this domain has, is, was also shown in those papers to interact with the N-terminus and basically keeps the N-terminal domain inactive. And once a protease like caspase 1, caspase 4, or others cleaves here, this aspartate residue um, um, in the linker, it will separate the, the N from the C-terminus and the N-terminus is free to kill the cell by inducing paraptosis. So how does the end terminus kill cells eventually? So this is the this this part here is what what triggers paraptosis. So I'll show you a couple of of, of, of data that that allowed people to to come to uh, a final model. So um, one is here. Um, this is just a movie from from that may, was made in my lab. So he, what happens to the end terminus? Um, after cleavage. Um, so here we hooked up the N-terminus with EGFP and here's the cleavage site and that's the C-terminus here. And you'll see that the protein is, uh, is initially uh, everywhere in the cell. And if I run the movie, um, you see that um, the N-terminus, which is tagged by GFP in this case, will translocate to the membrane periphery. You get this ballooning of the cell and, um, and you get this formation of these large clusters here. Um, another one, um, this is also supported by uh, um, basic biochemical data. So if you do a fractionation um, of, of cells undergoing paraptosis and ask when which fraction do you get um, the Casdermin D protein, um, uh, you can see that the Casdermin D protein is initially um, in the soluble fraction. So that would be the NS, this S150 fraction in non-treated cells. And once you infect with salmonella, which will activate the inflammasome, 10 or 20 minutes, uh, the protein is cleaved. So now we detect only the cleaved form, and now it translocates into the P150 and P10 fractions. So this would be this and here. This is basically fractions, um, uh, the plasma membrane fraction and the mitochondrial fraction. So the protein, once cleaved, will go 
towards uh, cellular membranes. So there's a translocation of gasderma enantiomers to membrane fractions. Um, this can also be done in vitro. So this was done by, by my group and other groups um, using liposomes. So here liposomes or polylipid, made from polylipid extracts were incubated with gasderma D um, without or with caspase one. So this is all the combinant proteins. Um, you can see gasderma D here, here on the Comasi is full length when there's no caspase. And once there is uh, caspase added, it will be processed into two subunits. So there's this cleavage happening and the end terminals will associate with the liposomes. That would be the L lane here and the C terminals will stay soluble. So that would be the S lane here. So the end terminals has this, this uh, affinity towards membranes. Now, what also the, was shown in those liposome experiments is that the liposomes eventually get permeabilized. So these are dye-release assays from liposomes basically treated with gasdermin D in the presence of the caspase. And over time, you get this release of, the, of, of dyes that can be measured, indicating that the, the, the association of the gasdermin D end terminals with those liposomes induces a permeabilization. Now, of course, we know that, that cells, peripatetic cells permeabilize as well. So people speculated that there might be some kind of pore-like structure uh, being formed, and this is indeed the case. So in 2016, several groups um, discovered that. So the, if, if liposomes are incubated with uh, gasdermin protein n terminis, so this would be either from gasdermin D, A, or, or A3, for example, you get this formation of these, these um, ring-like structure in those liposomes. So basically a large pores this can also be seen by atomic force microscopy here. So these are indeed large holes that are punctured into membranes that consist um, of this gasdermin N termini that are that, that oligomerize to form the pore. And um, this is more probably the latest work here from uh, Hao Wu's lab, where uh, they solve the structure of the gasdermin H3 pore. So this is the pore formed by the gasdermin H3 N terminals. So you can see is a, is a large beta bell shaped pore that is punched from the inside into the, into the plasma membrane of cells. Um, it has a 20 fold symmetry and a very large diameter. So it's 18 nanometers in inner diameter. So it's a very large pore that, is, that, that permeabilizes the plasma membrane from the inside. And um, we now believe that this is what causes a paraptotic cell death. So it's, it's a paraptosis is basically a cell that's caused by, by uh, permeabilization of true gasdermin uh, pores. So here is a little bit of summary of this. So it starts, um, this is from, from a review from, from uh, Veit Hornung's lab. So once the internal fragment has been generated by caspase cleavage, it will target the plasma membrane. It will start to oligomerize to form these this rings. So first it starts as crescent shaped structures, rings, these rings are, are large enough to allow ions um, to really be released or ions to get into the cells. Um, you will have also small proteins that are released from the cells. Um, eventually you have influx of, of water due to oncopic pressure into the cell, a ballooning of the cell, which I also showed in those, in those movies. And uh, eventually this uh, culminates in the rupture of the plasma membrane. So this is, how um, we believe uh, paraptotic cell death um, is happening. And of course, this rupture will then release more cytosolic content that is too large to go out through the plasma membrane pores. Now, uh, which, what I also want to uh, look at um, quickly is, is uh, are these gasdermin D pores really the direct mechanism that kills the cell or are actually other factors necessary? Or is it possible to have subletic pore formation? And would subletic pore formation actually be useful in some context? So um, what I showed you um, and what many people have seen is that um, gasdermin D is absolutely necessary for, for LDH release, similar to, to having a caspase here. So this is wild type of caspase deficient or gasdermin deficient macrophages, for example, infected with salmonella, and also for cytokine release. And Initially, it was believed that probably the, the cytokine release happens when um, the cell will rupture as, as a consequence of gasdermin D pore formation, which would, would, would make sense because once the membrane is ruptured, all the L1 can, can be released from the cells. 
And IL-1 is, is a special cytokine, so it has no, uh, pro, it has no uh, secretion signal, so it doesn't go out through the ER Golgi pathway. It needs some kind of other mechanism to be released. However, um, now over the last couple of years, this is work by, by, by our lab, but also by um, John Kagan's lab, and, and others have identified inflammasome activators that, that, that induce uh, what, what is now referred as sort of as the hyperactivated state of cells, where there is no apparent LDH release, no apparent cell that's um, ongoing, but there is measurable release of IL-1 beta, as shown here in the IL-1 beta lysis, which are the black bars, and this is still dependent on gas dermin D. So these are oxidized lipids like PGPC or PFPC that, that can induce this type of weird inflammasome activation, peptidoglycan fragments like here, PGN. Um, or for example, you can also observe that um, in neutrophils after canonical inflammasome activation, so the neutrophils don't die, but release uh, cytokines in a gasdermin D dependent manner. So this suggests that um, Indeed, uh, there is some release of IL-1, in this case, through gasdermin D pores, but the cells are, do not die. So this is this hyperactivation. So they are still alive or, or no, not lysing, and they release IL-1 through the pores. So something keeps alive, keeps these cells alive, um, despite the presence of gasdermin D in their membranes. Um, so this is this this are some you know this is not usually seen with most inflammasome activators. This really requires a sort of a low level, low, below threshold inflammasome activation, so that the cells don't lyse or don't die and still release IL one. So of course this raises enough uh, many questions. So actually you know the first one maybe is IL one even in, small enough to pass directly through the pores, and and how do the cells actually cope with because they're in deep pore formation. So um, to answer the first one, um, what do we know about IL-1? So IL-1 is in, or IL-1, IL-1 family cytokines are, are unusual cytokines in that they lack a signal sequence that would direct them to the ER Golgi pathway. So um, in the past, they have been proposed to be released by unconventional secretion. Um, so, which means basically an unknown other pathway. And many mechanisms have been proposed. So this is a summary here from uh, Kate Schroeder's uh, review on, on unconventional secretions. So secretory lysosomes, for example, have been proposed or microvesicles, exosomes, secretory autophagy, um, of course, passive, lysis, passive release during cell lysis, which you know, would be something happening during paraptosis, but also a direct membrane, plasma membrane translocation through some kind of channel. And it now emerges from, from these data that, that have been gained on, on, on the inflammasome and gasdermin D that probably this, uh, this release mechanism here could be directly to the gasdermin D pore. So the IL-1, mature IL-1 after it's cleaved by the caspase is very small, four to five nanometers, and the pore has a large diameter. So indeed, it's in theory, it's possible that IL-1 is released directly um, through the pores. Okay, the second question um, is like, can cells, you know, sort of uh, stay alive um, after inflammasome activation? Um, I'll show you uh, some unpublished data here um, that suggests this indeed, that this is the case. Um, so in this case, um, uh, Katerina, a student in the lab, uh, developed uh, uh, an optogenetically activatable gasdermin D. So this is a photoclavable protein here that is inserted between the N and the C terminals. And this allows, uh, this is, this cleaves itself once you shine blue light on it. And this allows us to, to, to dose because uh, the amount of gasdermin D activation really um, very, very exactly. So we can do a little bit gasdermin activation and not too much. Um, so, and so, so in this movie, you'll see that the cells, they are quickly exposed to blue light. So the, a little bit gasdermin D gets activated and then we turn off the light. So the cells will start blebbing, as you can see here, so they bleb. And once we turn off the light, they go back to normal and live on. So indeed, um, this suggests that these cells survived sort of the, this burst of gasdermin D activation. Um, so, so they can tolerate a certain degree of gasdermin D pores. And I don't want to go too much into that. We had a paper two years ago where we showed also which mechanism actually um, allows 
the, the cells to get rid of those because they're in the pores once they are in the membrane. So this is the uh, escort mediated membrane repair. Um, to summarize that here, once the pores are formed, the cells will react to pore formation um, in that it senses calcium that, that will leak in from the cytosolic, uh, from the extracellular space into the cell um, by assembling or the escort machinery, which is a machinery that deforms the membrane and allows to, to, to shed damaged parts of the membrane um, in forms of exosomes from the cell. So it will make these spirals that will pinch off the damaged part of the membrane, which contains gasdermin D pores and thereby allows the cell to survive longer. So in this movie, if you, if you focus on this cell, you will see vesicles being formed here at the tip of, of, of the cell. I hope this is, will be visible. Um, initially, nothing happens. Now the cell starts to undergo paraptotic cell death. And now you see always these vesicles appearing here that, um, that um, are pinched off by the escort system. And you can also, if you use uh, a tagged gasdermin D, um, you can also detect them in those vesicles, the gasdermin D pores. So these clusters here, the two clusters are two gasdermin D pores, we assume that are found in such a, such a vesicle, which is pinched off from a surviving cell. So this is just to, to show that, that indeed there are, there are mechanisms that cells employ regularly to repair uh, their membranes. And this might be used to, to uh, repair the damage done by gasdermin D pores. And most interesting actually is the, the recent development um, that, that actually showed uh, um, that gasdermin D pore formation and eventually cell lysis can genetically be uncoupled. So just a couple of weeks ago, a paper was published uh, again by Vishwa Dixit's group as usual, <laughs> um, uh, discovering, uh, reporting the discovery of a new protein. Um, called Ninjurin-1. Um, so Ninjurin-1 is a small plasma membrane protein. You can see it here, so two transmembrane helices and another helis on the extracellular leaflet, uh, on the extracellular side of cells. And what they showed is in that paper is that Ninjurin-1 is required um, for lysis or for cell lysis after gasdermin deactivation. So what, what, is, what they show is, for example, that the Ninj-1 macrophages um, here in red um, when compared um, to not release any LDH, similar to the gasdermin D knockout macrophages after uh, activation of the canonic, uh, non-canonical and the canonical inflammasome pathway. They also maintain the ballooning morphology. Um, so in the wild type, the balloons are formed, but eventually flatten because the cell lyses. But in the inch one knockout, these balloons stay and don't flatten. However, importantly, um, what they also show is that the cells still form gasdermin D pores and they release cytokines. So the pore, the gasdermin D pore is still formed, but the cell never lyses, um, which is a very interesting observation. And also even more striking, Ninch one um, um, has the same function during secondary necrosis. I don't know if you heard about this um, from, from the talk yesterday, toxin induced lysis and partially during necroptosis. So to, you know, this, this summarizes a little bit. So, um, so this ninch one protein seems to be the last step that, uh, that happens after you get membrane pore formation during cell death. So initially, uh, you know, here you have different types of cell death, toxin, pyroptosis, necroptosis, apoptosis, you know, you have uh, formation of, of pores like the gasdermin D pores or the MLKL channels here in the membrane. And this, allow, this induces some kind of swelling of the cell, which, maybe it's linked to ninja one activation. What happens is that the ninja one protein then um, senses some kind of signals, oligomerizes, and then completely destroys uh, the membrane to release dumps. So this, you know, what ninja one sense is, senses is not clear, um, or how it destroys the membrane, or whether there are other ninja one pro like proteins is unknown, but it seems to be the very last step that, um, that happens to a paraptotic cell. So, um, which is quite nice because now um, uh, this also shows that, that uh, the gasdermin D pore itself can already release uh, cytokines and, and have a signaling function, but it needs then the action of ninja one to eventually completely rupture the cell membrane. So the gasdermin D pores do not destroy the membranes. They just permeabilize the membranes. It's the ninja one protein that destroys somehow uh, the plasma membrane afterwards.
Okay, so I'll uh, quickly come uh, to the to the to the last part I wanted to highlight. So, what's the physiological role of, of paraptosis? So, paraptosis um, is of course engaged in the context of of pathogen infection. Um, so, it must somehow prevent pathogen or restrict pathogen replication. Um, it has been shown that. Uh, um, the, it removes the replicative niche, for example, of intracellular pathogens. So if you, if you are a virus that infects a cell, once the cell undergoes paraptotic cell, that your host is dead. Um, and this also prevents further replication of, of the virus. And this might be also in the, uh, the case for certain bacterial infections. And um, also this, the cytokines that are released allows a recruitment of other effector cells um, to the site of infection. Um, to eventually restrict uh, pathogen replication. However, there's also a little bit of, of, of other um, functions that have been proposed. So as we also proposed that it, uh, the, the lysis of the cell eventually will expose intracellular bacteria to uh, extracellular immune uh, mechanisms, so not intra-extracellular immune mechanisms like neutrophils and antibodies. Um, a new concept has also been uh, proposed where the dying cell uh, traps the bacteria so that they can be more easily aphrocytosed. Um, or when, uh, when uh, the dead cell is aphrocytosed, that the bacteria can be cleared. And even it has been proposed that gasdermin D pores are able to directly damage or kill bacteria, uh, bacterial cells. So I just want to highlight uh, some of these. So um, this, this concept of pyroptosis trapping bacteria was developed by Ed Miao's lab. So what they could show is that intracellular bacteria like salmonella, they remain trapped within paraptotic cell. Um, and that these paraptotic cells are um, attract actually neutrophils. And um, so the, here, for example, they had uh, this uh, neutrophil, so Lysix G positive, that has um, eaten up um, a macrophage, uh, which is seen here by the CD68 signal. And through that also the, the bacteria that are contained within this macrochip tag with GFP. And this allows then the neutrophil to, to kill uh, those bacteria. And uh, so the, in that paper also, they suggest that the apoptotic cell corpses are more aphrocytosed by macrophages and that the paraptotic cell corpses, which they call pits for paraptosis or pouring used intracellular traps are then more attracting neutrophils and the neutrophils do the killing job uh, eventually. So this is one way by which uh, paraptosis would have, uh, have an ability to restrict uh, bacterial replication. There's also a suggestion that paraptosis has uh, directly damages or kills bacteria. So when you look at, um, when you do EM analysis of bacteria within the paraptotic cells, you can see that the bacteria um, um, look uh, ruffled. So this is, this is a bacterium here, uh, an EM of a bacterium that is in a, in a live cell, there, so it looks very nice. And here, this is in a paraptotic cell where the bacterium seems to be deformed and ruffled, which indicates a potential damage to the, to the bacteria. Now, um, what uh, there was also in, in, in this paper here from Jorgensen in 2016, what they also showed is that when you they, uh, then isolate bacteria from either those you know, live cells or paraptotic cells, and expose them to further stressors like uh, ROS, polymyxin B, or antibiotics, that the bacteria that were isolated from paraptotic cells are sort of less viable. So you can see that there is a reduction of CFU when we plate those bacteria. Um, and this is the same also for, for, dif uh, list for different types of bacteria, Listeria, Citrobacter, Burkholderia um, as well. So this suggests, um, uh, yeah, basically that suggested that that there is that there's something happening to bacteria in a paraptotic cell that that basically weakens their membranes, and uh, this goes a little bit along with uh, some data that were published in uh, by um, Hao Wu and, and Judy Lieberman in, in the 2016 Nature paper that paraptosis has a direct ability to damage or kill bacterial cells. So um, basically. Um, what they propose is that cardiolipin, which is found in bacterial membranes or the mitochondrial uh, membrane, attract, can allow gasdermin D pores um, to target bacteria and to kill uh, bacteria. And they did you know, these type of assays here, CFU plating, where they incubate uh, 
bacteria either with full length as vitamin D here in gray, so there's no reduction of bacteria um, bacterial growth or with casdermin and terminus, and you can see this drop of bacterial numbers here in the black bars, suggesting that uh, the casdermin D pore has also the ability to maybe directly kill bacteria. Now, this is done in vitro, so it's not so clear if this will eventually also be happening um, in an infecting cell, which this still needs to be shown. Okay, so I will skip this part and I'll come directly to the end. Um, uh, so, you know, that was what I wanted to say about paraptotic cell death. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy if there's more questions to discuss the second part as well. Okay, well, first, uh, Gustavo. All right, uh, Peter. Uh, I think Karina is Jerry, but I, I can start with the one uh, personal question about this new protein, Ninja. One, so, you know, what does it, this really do? And uh, if you have a mutant of Ninja One, does these cells mm -hmm. do not die or they yeah. die eventually, yeah. but not with this burst mm -hmm. kind of life? Yeah, so I think the, I'll answer the, the second question first. So the, the cell is still dead. So this was also quite clear from the from the paper from you know uh, Dixit that the cell um, basically the permeabilization by the gasdermin D pore will eventually um, you know kill the cell, but the cell will not lyse and release large pumps. You know, like LDH will not be released and larger pumps. So it will die, but it will die a less inflammatory type of death. I would put it like this, probably. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This does this was uh, actually tested because, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, IL one would be released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they show that uh, oh, the yeah. cytokines are still released. Yeah, yeah. So we we heard from Seamus that mm -hmm. uh, you know perhaps or to his view perhaps the, the mm -hmm. most effective damps are mm -hmm. IL one members. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it wouldn't matter then actually. Um... When it comes, yeah, the question is like, what, what causes, what is, what is important about paraptosis? Which PAMs need to be released to cause, you know, to restrict the pathogen replication, attract immune cells? So if it's IL-1, then it wouldn't matter whether you have an inch one or not, I would speculate. But if it's other types of, of PAMs, then maybe the response will be different. So I, uh, the paper only came out, right? Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. now all of us have to get their hands on onto some ninja one knockout mice and test them in a bacteria exactly. infection and compare them to the gasdermin D knockouts and we'll see yeah. like whether ninja one or gasdermin D is important for restriction. Yeah. And uh, how ninja one works, I think nobody really knows so far. Uh, if I when I read the paper, um, it seems that. Um, so Ninch one has this extracellular he alpha helical domain, which is sort of an amphiphatic domain, which you know, is also probably found in MLKL. So it has some, potentially this domain has a membrane disrupting activity, um, whether it forms a pore or just sort of destabilizes the membrane, I, I think is not clear. Um, what is also not clear is what it would sense Ninch one So they speculate that maybe it senses cell swelling to the curvature of the membrane or, I don't know. They, I think this will be the next paper. Cool. Awesome. Really. Peter, here in the chat of uh, YouTube, Angelica, uh, question. Is there any role for other gathering in the inflammatory pathway? Mm -hmm. The gathering A that is mm -hmm. abundant in the skin? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I, I can then show maybe these slides here quickly. So uh, let's see, can I share the screen once more? Um, so what are the, uh, so this question is basically, what are the other gasdermins doing, right? Mm -hmm. So the other gasdermins- In the inflammasome pathway. In the inflammasome pathway, uh, there doesn't seem to be at this point a role for the other gasdermins. So the, in the inflammasome pathway is mostly gasdermin D that is involved mm -hmm. both in humans and mice. Um, but the other gasdermin, so, so gasdermin 
uh, where is it E or DFNA5, gasdermin now, gasdermin A and B, um, seem to play a role in the apoptotic pathway. So it has been shown that apoptotic caspases like caspase 3 can cleave and caspase 7 also to some degree, cleave gasdermin E and um, and the granzymes, so granzyme A and B, uh, which are used by cytotoxic cells to kill um, infected cells, for example, cancer cells, will cleave gasdermin A and B, so the, those guys here. And so, so it seems that the other gasdermin play a role to some degree in the, in the apoptotic pathways, which is maybe surprising, right? Because then they also allow the conversion of what is supposed to be a non-immunogenic cell death into right. a inflammatory cell death, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Same for caspase 8. Caspase 8 is... Yeah, so we, we and others have seen that caspase 8 actually can uh, cleave gasdermin D and basically um, cause uh, a para or then the, the death looks paraptotic and it doesn't look like, uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have this apoptotic morphology. And, and, but here I think it's, it is really uh, depends uh, like on, on each cell type and on how much gasdermins do these cells express. So if you have a cell that expresses a lot of gasdermin E and activates caspase 3, this cell will eventually not induce, it will, it will induce the apoptotic signaling pathway, but the outcome will not be apoptosis as we know it from the morphology of apoptotic bodies, but the outcome will be paraptotic cell death by ballooning and membrane rupture. So the, the, basically that will also, I guess, change uh, how, the, how the immune system reacts to that cell then, right? Because if it ruptures and releases pumps and, and whatever, this will be a highly immunogenic cell death, while if it remains in apoptotic morphology, this will be a less inflammatory. I don't know, maybe also plays a role for atherocytosis of those cells eventually, which needs to be looked at. So the level, you know, level of gasdermin D can really change the fate of a cell. Thanks, Peter. Hemi, I think, Hemi, yeah. Uh, Hemi, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, so I don't know if this question makes sense. Yes. Um, once the inflammasome is um, assembled and gadesimine gets cleaved, mm -hmm. and you talk about the cells that survive this process, right? Mm -hmm. And do you think these cells later on have a way to deassemble the inflammasome? And mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's a good question. So um, I think it's, it, it depends a little bit on how long they will receive the signal and how strong the signal will be um, that, so they can initially cope with some gasdermin D uh, activation and pore formation, but at, at one point you will just overwhelm that and the cell will eventually die. So there's a fine balance, how much signal they receive. And, and there was actually a, an interesting paper from, um, from K Traders group a couple of years ago that suggested that, that the, the cas active caspase one production is limited to like 30, minutes to one hour after the signal is received. So if it, in, during this phase, the cell can basically keep its membrane intact, it will probably survive eventually, yeah. And, and maybe this, uh, you know, of course, if we do an in vitro experiment you know, with macrophages, um, as we all like to do, we throw as much stimulus on it as possible because we want to have, you know, cell death, we want to measure something, right? But this is not necessarily what, what, what these cells will, how the cells will react in, in the body during infection. Because if, if you look in, in a, for example, in a salmonella infected mice, you don't see many bacteria in a cell, right? There's maybe one or two. Um, so the, the, what we get in vivo will be always probably a much lower activation of inflammasomes and maybe more survival and more uh, subletic gasdermin D pore formation, while in vitro we, we want to measure something. So we throw an MOI of 50 on, the, on those cells and we are happy to see something. So Peter, what about this spec again? <laughs> you, you mentioned that, you know, we need only like one rod, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, micromolecular yeah. to then start all this filament uh, mm -hmm. Growing, uh, so how, how does it work then in vivo? I imagine that just one 
mm -hmm. fact that the, you know bacteria would drive um, this. Yeah, we yeah, we would expect that probably one bacterium would be already sufficient to form a spec. And this is sort of something that can be seen, for example, with certain infections like with Francisella infection, you can see one single bacterializing and the DNA being released and the spec being formed on those that DNA close to that bacterium. Um, uh, but again, there's the, you know, maybe the, this spec might not yet kill the cell. This, this we don't know because there is a limited time where caspase-1 be, can be activated based on, the, on Kate's paper. Um, the, so once the caspase leaves the spec, it basically turns itself off. So it's only active while it's on the spec. Um, so there's sort of a, a time window when the caspase can be active afterwards no longer. And maybe if you survive that, you, you, know, you, you live. Yeah, you end up with, with no caspase activation, but the blood yeah. is back inside your well, event, Yeah, I guess that event, the, the fate in, of such a spec would be then that it gets uh, targeted by autophagy or, or some pathway that can get rid of it. Although that nobody has looked into yeah, that. Yeah, so that, that would be cool to show. Yeah, yeah. I think Louisa. Louisa. Hi. So first of all, congratulations on your amazing lecture. It was very didactic and complete, fantastic. So I have a question in terms of the physiological role of peroptosis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even considering those spore inducer traps that are inducted mm -hmm. after peroptosis, could you imagine a situation where peroptosis occurrence could favor the infection and pathogen spread? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how would it work? For example, yeah. some pathogens mm -hmm. escaping those traps mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. another magnus? I think uh, that there are several instances where pyroptosis was shown actually to be uh, beneficial for the pathogen. So this was this is in the case of pathogens um, that uh, do not invade cells. So there, for example, the one example is Pseudomonas infections, where the pathogen does not invade macrophages in the lung, but induces pyroptosis of those, those macrophages. So by this, it can escape sort of the uh, you know, being phagocytosed eventually by macrophages. But this is because it never actually ever goes in, but just kills them from the outside. Um, and for some pathogen, bacterial pathogens, it has been shown that they can survive being then taken up um, by aphrocytosis, and then they could reinfect um, the aphrocytosing cell. So, so if, if, the, if the cell that aphrocytosis, the paraptotic cell, is not really... Um, you know, ready to to uh, kill the pathogen as well. Those pathogens might actually spread. Then, yeah, but this has not been looked at into too much detail. So I think it's in theory possible, but how that looks in, in such an aphrocytosing cell, like how the bacteria gets out of the of the the phagosome, uh, I cannot imagine. Yeah, it's probably very messy. Thank you. Peter, I may have the last question due to the, the time. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from Cristina Munoz Pinedo. Mm -hmm. um, so, if caspase it can cleave gasdermin D, mm -hmm. can death receptors activate gasdermin D? Uh, and have they, have they been shown to induce paraptosis? Mm -hmm. Could you comment on which cell types could do this then? Okay. Um, yeah, so um, it has been shown that. Um, if you induce, uh, you know, the extrinsic apoptotic pathway, you know, caspase eight, so you assemble complex, uh, you know, the different complex to A, to B, and so forth, that the caspase eight that uh, that is activated by those complexes has the ability to cleave gasdermin D um, to some degree, especially complex to B seems to be very uh, efficient at. Act activating enough caspase 8 so that it cleaves gasdermin D and then kills the cell through pyroptosis. So this happens, for example, in macrophages, mouse macrophages, you can observe that. Um, if you do TNF, uh, you know, TNF and SPAC mimetic and so forth, like different, you know, stimulation of the extrinsic pathway. So it is possible. Um, what's the function of this? Why would, would you want to kill the cell by pyroptosis after engaging caspase 8 is not clear to me. So there, I, I don't, I don't know why that would be happening, but it happens. Yeah. 
Gut. Okay. Yeah, sorry for going a little bit over time. There was not that much no. uh, time for discussion. <laughs> but uh, if there is any other question, send me an email. <laughs> I'm happy to answer. Okay, Peter. Thank you very much okay. again. <laughs> Thanks for, for the invitation. And fantastic lecture. You should Great. People love it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. We're going to now uh, break for 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. for the people who are watching us uh, at the YouTube, please close your window, open another tab and paste the link again. I think it goes easier uh, straight to the to our streaming uh, later on in 15 minutes. Okay. All hey. right.